before that, it was I teach people to develop their own dinosaur balls. <laughs> but that took a bit more explaining. Well, let's talk about that in reverse order. Let's talk about dino balls first, okay? Because that when I when I first met you, that, that I was I mean every I'm sure everybody's pretty curious about that. All right, <laughs> and then we'll talk about, about betting on you. So let's go. What what is this dino balls nonsense? Because what's bigger than regular balls? Yeah, Goddamn dinosaur balls. Mm. And it's a metaphor, really, because if you look at uh, ancient uh, biology, dinosaurs being cold-blooded, I think most of their genitalia were inside them, uh, certainly their testicles. <laughs> so uh, it is a metaphor. It's not meant to be purely masculine. It's really about teaching people to be... Uh, far more courageous than what they believe they can be and it ties in with a lot of the other it ties in with the betting on you principles as well so it is very relevant but it's more dialed in there most of us never learned how to train our brains which is why most of us needlessly settle struggle and worse suffer my name is chris doris and i want to make brain training mainstream this is my series tough talks conversations on mental toughness i'm interviewing badasses from all walks of life on what mental toughness means to them and their unique approaches to strengthening their minds. Hey everybody, welcome back to Tough Talks, conversations on mental toughness. I am your host, Chris Doris, and before we get to our remarkable guest today, <laughs> uh, and I, I chuckle like that because I, I'm excited to share him with you. He's, he's something else. <laughs> uh, let's take care of our one housekeeping item. So if you are not receiving the daily dose mental toughness tips in 30 seconds or less in your email inbox every single day of the year at around 6 a.m. your local time, wherever you are on the planet, and if you're not getting notifications of my new blog posts that come out every Tuesday, and if you're not getting notifications of these new uh, Tough Talks podcast episodes, then let's just fix that very simply by going to ChristopherDoris.com backslash lists, L-I-S-T-S, ChristopherDoris backslash, ChristopherDoris.com backslash lists, name, email, click problem solve, yeah, get all the goods, Laban Ditchburn is his name. He goes by the nickname of Dino Balls. Yes, we will have him explain that. Uh, he's got a great new book called Bet on You, uh, which I am actually awaiting. I, he shared with me parts of the transcript, and uh, um, we're, I'm definitely going to ask him to share uh, at least a bit of the opening chapter because it's pretty riveting. Uh, and what it is is a glimpse into you know, the depth of his darkness and addiction. You know, and the kind of crap that he was willing to do to feed the um, the pain that he was experiencing. And he's a great storyteller. He's a pretty good impressionist. And um, <laughs> impressionist or impersonator? Y you guys know the answer to that. I don't. He impersonates people. So I guess it's impersonator. Does good imp impressions? I don't know. So um, let me read you his bio, it's, it's cool. After conquering the full gamut of addictions from food, booze, sex, gambling, and drugs, Laban now defines the word transformation. He cured his own incurable disease, and that's not, he's not talking about the addictions there. He's, he's talking about uh, a gut disease. He cured his own incurable disease and soon realized that taking everything at face value wasn't always the best way forward. When he repaired the body, he also healed his mind and spirit. As a featured keynote speaker, accountability coach, and host of the Become Your Own Superhero podcast, Laban's burning passion is to inspire change to those that want it and are ready to take the first steps to do so. Laban now uses his own experience as fuel, and his stories will empower you through unashamed vulnerability. Love that about him. They will for and he's really good at that. They will force you to rethink what you thought was possible and how you can now head towards a life you only ever read about. 
one of my favorite things about Laban is that he doesn't seem to give much of a crap uh, about whether or not people take offense to him. So uh, that I will say going in uh, that keep in mind, I mean, he doesn't go out of his way to offend people, but he sure as hell does not avoid it. And I must say that is one of my favorite attributes of him is the courage to be transparent. I think it's very, very liberating. So uh, I know I would never invite someone on to this podcast as a guest if I wasn't infinitely convinced in advance because I do pretty good vetting and research because everybody's got to be a servant in order to be a guest on the podcast. You have to be, you have to demonstrate true commitment to service and he does that beautifully. So I'm excited to bring him, share him with you now. He's out here waiting somewhere for us. Where are you at, buddy? Where are you, Laban? There he is, the man, Laban Dishburn. What up, dog? Chris Doris, it's an honor, a pleasure, and just a plain damn thrill to see you again. Pleasure is all mine, sir. I've been looking forward to reconnecting with you. Yo, I got a quick question for you. Uh, when somebody, you meet somebody for the first time and they say, hi, Laban, what do you do? What's your answer? I teach people to bet on themselves, Chris Doris. I teach people to bet on themselves. Before that, it was, I teach people to develop their own dinosaur balls. <laughs> <laughs> but that took a bit more explaining. Well, let's talk about that in reverse order. Let's talk about dino balls first, okay? Because that when I, when I first met you, that, that I was, I mean, every, I'm sure everybody's pretty curious about that, all right? <laughs> And then we'll talk about betting on you. So let's go. What, what is this dino balls nonsense? Because what's bigger than regular balls? Yeah, Goddamn dinosaur balls. Mm. And it's a metaphor, really, because if you look at uh, ancient uh, biology, dinosaurs being cold-blooded, I think most of their genitalia were inside them, uh, certainly their testicles. <laughs> so uh, it is a metaphor. It's not meant to be purely masculine. It's really about teaching people to be uh far more courageous than what they believe they can be and it ties in with a lot of the other it ties in with the betting on you principles as well so it is very relevant but it's more dialed in there so you teach people how to be more courageous than they think that they can be how do you teach somebody to be more courageous well there's a couple of components that i think are really important and one thing that i really pride myself on chris is to just lead by example with everything that I do. Oh. I stay I stay out of the way of talking about things that I'm yet to experience. And if I need to talk about something that I haven't, it's very clear that I haven't done it. And I think that's a really important distinction because there's so much so much mistruth in the world right now. There's so much so many people that are disingenuous or unable to be authentic and real. And I think people are craving the truth right now. And simply by sharing my own experiences. This is how I did it. Can't guarantee it's going to work for you, but this is how I know how to do it. That's what I think is a really good place to start. So one of my first experiences of you is that you just, you um, are a person who doesn't seem to hesitate to ask for what he wants. Is that an accurate observation? It's, uh, yeah, spot on. And, and it was really inspiring. And I, and I don't mean that from like, like I, I ought to put more around that though, because it's like, it's not just about asking for what you want, because there's a lot of people that are like, like a lot, like on LinkedIn, that, that are like irrelevant, that do no research whatsoever before they reach out with an ask. That's not you. So, so, so you've got two things, and I want to make that real abundantly clear, which is that you've got the courage to ask for what you want. And a lot of people are really afraid about that. And you also are driven purely by service. And you do your homework, like you do your homework. Right? You make sure that if you're going to make an ask, you do it in a very re relevant way. So I want to make sure that that's abundantly clear. Yeah, I, and, I, and I appreciate your kind words on that. It's uh, 
where it's driven from is really two things. But the first thing is I've developed something that's really worked well for me. And I think it works well with everyone. It's just going into every single interaction, more or less with what value can I add this person's life? And that's not someone on LinkedIn all the time. That might be the checkout girl who's scanning the grocery items, you know, and little, little wee examples that people can use. She might say to me, hi, how are you going? And have heard good. Thank you. 150 times before, yeah. but I, depending on where I'm at, I might say, honestly, and she'll say, yeah, honestly. And I'll say, I'm blessed. And she'll say, you're blessed. And I'll say, I got food in my belly, I got clothes on my back, the love of a beautiful woman. And that interaction makes me feel awesome because you can see her eyes light up. She feels good. And then she just, she pays that forward to mm. to her family when she goes home or whatever and yeah. and mixes things up a little bit. And and, uh, and so when it comes to the the asking part, I suppose there's already a deeper, much deeper connection there. Like it's very rare that I would just go in cold and say, "Hey, look, I need some help," without having built any any connection there. I think that's a really important distinction. Not always the case because you can't always do it, but for the most part, there's some value that's already been added there. Very important, I think. Congratulations are in order for your new book. Bet on you. Congrats, man. Thank you very much. I'm very excited. It's yeah. Outrageous. Yeah, 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 it is. I know. I've, I've read, um, I, I haven't read it all yet. Um, but I did read some of it. <laughs> and I'm hoping that you can share with us how you brilliantly open it. My two queens. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Can we go there? Yeah, absolutely. I, I can read the damn thing if you like. <laughs> we can do it. What's that? Yeah, you did it's, that. A oh, it's a 10 minute read. It might be a bit long, but um, what, what do you want to know specifically? Uh, what do you need to know? Okay. Well, just tell us about your history. Tell us about like, you know, your story is, is fascinating. You had a lot going on, right? Addictions wise. And, um, and, I, and I think what's, what I'm asking for is a bit of the story because your story is incredible and you're, great, you're an amazing storyteller. And then, of course, what have you done with that story? What have you done? How have you leveraged that, that experience to, to recreate yourself? Yeah, well, it's really important uh, to understand something. So huh? six years ago, after more rock bottoms than I can care to remember, I finally hit the bottom one and it was at a po point in my life where I was consumed by esca escapism and behavior. And at the time I was gambling prolifically, mainly on horse racing. This particular incident, it was about midnight on a Tuesday night, nestled up in my bed, my laptop prized open, gambling on a horse race in a country that I wasn't in, spending money that wasn't mine. And I had this epiphanous moment where I was like, the life that I imagined for myself is not this. And there was a phone number in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen that I'd never seen before. And I looked down, it was the number for the gambler's helpline over here in Australia. And I just, I instinctively just called the number and I spoke to this amazing woman, Mary, and I call her Mary Magdalene. And the conversation we had was mind blowing. She spoke to me about gamblers experience far higher rates than suicide than any of the other hedonistic behaviors because of how quickly people lose everything. Oh. And it really struck me and it scared the pants off me. And through that experience, I was able to get access to a, a gambling psychologist for free for 18 months, paid for by the taxes from poker machine losses over here, right? And wow. the very first session with the psychologist, she spoke about the link between escapism behavior and coping mechanisms that children develop as a result of growing up in a less than nurturing environment, which is a fancy phrase for dysfunction, which for me was nothing more innocuous than being a child of divorce. Mum and dad split up when I was three and a half. 
Those two were doing the best they could with the tools they had available, but they were ill-equipped to esteem themselves, let alone their children. Mm. And so I grew up using, as a young, really young man, video games and TV and movie and, and self-deprecating humor to deal with all of that trauma that I took on as a kid. And then as I got old enough to consume alcohol and then drugs and, you know, philandering, uh, if people even use that word anymore, anything that I could to really step away from what was there. And it was only when I started to address and, and then understand that what I went through was fixable by, for me, reverse engineering what I'd gone through to then get to the root cause. I'm a very big fan of addressing the cause rather than covering up the symptom in, in all areas of my life. And so the book has a number of stories of my life from when I was very, very young to the last couple of years. And that particular story that you're referencing involves me and a, an incident with two very glamorous strippers that propositioned me uh, to go and take it further, stepping into that high class escort realm. And then the story associated with uh, what happened um, when I was trying to get the money for it, which involves um, the casino. And uh, maybe if people want to read it, because <laughs> I don't want to give away the, the story, but I'm happy to go into more if you need some more intel. Uh, I would love some more intel, please. <laughs> Look, when you sent it to me before you even published, you shared that part with me. Do you remember my reaction? It's probably the same reaction you get from everyone. Holy effing shit. Because I'm like that you, I was captivated. I was in rapture. You had me after the first six words. So I don't know, man. It's like, I think you, this is like you, you could share a little bit. Why don't you read some of it if you want and then, and you know, <clears throat> get people's appetites wet. Well, it's I, powerful, I, man. It's incredibly powerful. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, if you'll indulge me, I, I, maybe I can read the first uh, few minutes Bring to it on. A taste because what I want to do is I want to, like I want to, I want to get to a point in, in my speaking uh, career where I'm able to, I'm able to have memorized um, the whole book. Oh, so, wow. Um, wow. And, and I think, I think <laughs> if, if I can do that, the storytelling component is just going to go next level. But anyway, let me read you the first few minutes and we'll just see what the audience thinks, thinks of this. So the first chapter is called My Two Queens. Why don't you take us home and we'll let you do anything you want, she whispered. <laughs> A puff of warm breath from the tea and want activated the erogenous zone of my lips. The Eastern Bloc accent made me think of Bond girls, but of course, they were physically perfect and smelling like strawberries. Tall, athletic, olive skinned and brunette with super long eyelashes that fluttered in my direction. Hair up, but more than long enough to t travel down past their perfect dairy ears. Their red knee high Louboutins fitted with sparkling diamantes sent rainbows of light in every direction. I was voluntarily trapped on a huge Chesterfield sofa with two of the most beautiful women I'd ever seen. Double in trouble, they called themselves, preferring mystique and anonymity. They were entrepreneurs of the highest order, and I had just been offered the ultimate indecent proposal. And what would my investment be? I asked, my shoulders tensed into my neck with anticipation of their response. Two thousand dollars cash, Trouble said. Anything you want. Remaining cool like an Alaskan winter, I responded with feigned nonchalance. Ladies, 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 you've seen what I've spent tonight. I couldn't pay that much if I wanted to. Me, two pals visiting from overseas, and another mate had decided a gentleman's club would be our home for the evening. Like soldiers released on shore leave, we steam trained into that place with blood alcohol levels to blind most amateurs. We needed a quick chemical intervention to level out the intoxication. A chance encounter with a fellow patron provided us exactly what we needed. Sporting a traditional ponytail, buffalo leather vest, and more tassels than Dolly Parton's wardrobe, he looked to be a legitimate Native American. 
I stood alongside him at the men's urinal and channeled my inner Geronimo. How? Oh, I said, using my lowest octave and raising my right hand to show I held no weapon and meant no harm. My left hand remained attached to my own weapon, as urinating on another man's shoes is never cool at the best of times. He was as high as a kite, and he knew that I knew. What do you need? He bellowed in an even deeper voice, his accent confirming my guess. Drugs, please, I inquired. He grinned, zipped up his fly, and within 60 seconds, I'd exchanged cash for a fun-sized Ziploc bag of dusty green pills. They had the Mitsubishi logo pressed into them, a.k.a. green Mitsis for all you retired ravers out there. And they looked real enough. It's astonishing the reckless levels of confidence I placed in drug dealers when it came to consuming recreational drugs. Mind you, I did the same with the legal stuff, and you'll soon find out how well that turned out. Without further thought, I gulped down two pills, room temp temperature whiskey, my only lubricant. I shuddered uncomfortably as the alcohol attacked my central nervous system and carried the mystery chemical cocktail down my gullet and into my stomach. 30 minutes later, I was fueled by top shelf spirits, huge amounts of dopamine, and Christ only knows what else. Sweat poured from my forehead and my face distorted into a lip-chewing, human hybrid, lizard person. Something between a troll and a goblin? A troblin? My pleasure receptors lit up like the 4th of July and a river of sexual energy cascaded into my loins. If you've ever taken MDMA, you'll empathize. If not, imagine the best orgasm you've ever had. Now, fall in love with everyone you meet. Now, win the lottery and you're not even close. The pleasure extends the entire length of your body and doesn't finish for hours. Sounds awesome, hey? The after effects, however, make suicide seem like a real and viable option. When sober, I craved the feminine touch, but pumped me full of a man-made love drug, and I became hornier than a short-nosed fruit bat. And speaking of fruit, from the blur of my intoxication, the strawberry-scented double in trouble both appeared. Hello, handsome. Intoxicated by their scent, charm and seduction, it was less than 60 seconds before I was led down to the dungeon, a special section of the club designed for you to lose yourself. One lap dance became two, three became four, and four made it the most expensive night I'd ever had. Training the nearby cash machine, I quickly maxed out the, my daily limit of $1,000. So that 2000 cash they mentioned? Impossible. My mates didn't have it, nor did I, and even if I did, I couldn't access that much cash. Make it 1600 That's our final offer. Double counted. Done. Give me 30 minutes, ladies. Sure thing, little of a boy. They both grinned. I didn't have the 1600 needed, but I had 800 and I knew how to get the rest. The strip club was located half a mile from Crown Casino, Australia's flagship gambling venue. That was my new destination, and I made it in record time. As the clock, st the clock struck midnight, a new day reset, and so did my withdrawal limit. I checked my bank balance, $800. Withdraw, yes. Like Dustin Hoffman in Rain Man, I calmly entered the gaming floor via the escalator, spied the high rollers room, and beelined straight to the blackjack table. I definitely, definitely knew what I was doing. Here's a crash course if you've never played blackjack. Each player is dealt two cards, individually face up. The dealer has also dealt two cards, one exposed and one hidden. The value of cards two through 10 is their face value. Jack, queen and king are all worth 10. Aces can be worth one or 11. A hand's value is the sum of the card's value. The dealer then reveals the hidden card and must draw cards one by one until the cards total up to 17 points. At 17 points or higher, the dealer must stop. Players bet on the basis that they will individually have better hands than the dealer. As I traded my cash for eight $100 chips, nerves forced me to stand rather than sit. The dealer pushed the pile towards me and I carefully pushed the pile back, resting them perfectly in the felt box. I had just laid the single biggest bet of my life in order to get laid. And that would have been funny if the situation wasn't so tense. All I needed was one, favor in my, one result in my favor and I would have the resources to fund a hedonistic rampage that would make Hugh Hefner blush. Oh. Shit. I was about to engage in every man's fantasy. Two willing and beautiful women, a gift from a God I didn't believe in, but who obviously believed in me. The power I felt placing such a large bet was simply magnificent. Even on such a high limit table, the whites of everyone's eyes added even more light to an already well illuminated room. 
With the final wages placed, the dealer waved her hand across the table and affirmed, no more bets. As she finished her sentence, the irony of the situation hit. I had already blown $1,000 on the night. Now I was risking $800 to try and win $1,600 to pay for something that, had I just cut to the chase at the very start of the evening, would have saved me all that mucking about. Fuck, I bemused. Why do I make my life so complicated? The game commenced and the blackjack began. Queen, I yelled violently, slapping my hand on the table. That's ten, I counted in my head. The croupier dealt her own cards and delivered a king of spades. Her second card was placed face down, hidden from everyone's view. My heartbeat was already racing from my sprint to the casino complex. Now it had more beats per minute than 90s techno. The second round of cards arrived, and to my utter delight, the queen arrived. Yes, I exclaimed aloud. My yell scared the crap out of the craps table and the mahjong from the mahjongers. The dealer delivered the rest of the cards in silence and the remaining gamblers surrounding me all went bust. I could feel them silently wishing unimaginable harm to the unsuspecting croupier. But undeterred, she slid her king of spades gently underneath her mystery card and flipped it into the air like an Olympic diver executing a simple rotation. In super slow motion, the dealer's card revealed itself next to the king. Ace. An ace of fucking spades. Like watching passenger jets plow into the Twin Towers, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The god I didn't believe in had failed me. Blackjack, the dealer reluctantly called out. A collective gasp from the audience broke the silence, simultaneously sucking the air from the room in my lungs. The dealer funneled my losing chips into a small black hole. I wish I could have joined them. My vision blurred and a huge wave of nausea swept over me like a giant vomity blanket. I staggered from the table, my legs suddenly useless. Was it possible to feel any worse than this? Whoo, baby! <laughs> my two queens. What a what a brilliant guy! And that's all. That's all totally true. It's I, it's it sounds unbelievable right. to read it back, but I swear to God on my mother's life that absolutely happened. Mm. Was that the bottom of the rock bottoms? I was trying to work out roughly when that happened when I was uh, writing the book, and and my rock bottom happened when I was 35 years of age. I'm 41 now. It was six years ago. That incident happened 16 years ago. Oh my goodness. So there's, there's been a lot go on. Uh, Let me ask you, why do you share that? Why do you open with that? Do you know what? It wasn't the original opening chapter. The original opening chapter was the what I was shared with you before about the gambling on the horse race. And, and I forgot about that story. And when I remembered, I was like, that is just too good to not put at the front just in terms, cause the, like, I really want the book to be really entertaining for people to read. And my life as it turns out has been fairly entertaining at times. So like, why not give people an enjoyment while they're learning something really impactful and, and uh, it's such an outrageous story that I, I just, I hope that it resonates with people, you know, gets them. I want to read more. I want to, I want to learn more about this guy. Well, yeah, it's painful. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm like, Oh God, don't do that. No, not that. Also, go oh, shit. You know, what is, um, what was the inspiration behind writing the book? So it's the most wonderful story, Chris. My journey in, into being a speaker and an author and coach is fairly fresh. I've only in the last couple of years figured out what my reason for being on the planet is. Oh. And when I finally figured it out and started that journey towards it, it was like March 2020. And so my very first paid speaking gig was or gigs were about to take off in April of 2020. And we all know what happened last year, right? So I needed a, I needed a platform. I needed a, a way to get my message out. And so I created the podcast series, uh, Become Your Own Superhero. And in the first 10 episodes, I was able to land 
an idol of mine, Les Brown. Oh, uh, oh. And I got to pronounce it Les, Les Brown, so that people just say, who's Liz? And he came, <laughs> he, he came on the podcast and something magical happened. Before we even started recording, I asked him what, what he thought of the name of the podcast. Yeah. And he just absolutely encapsulated for anyone that knows Les Brown, you've heard him speak or seen him. He's just largely regarded as one of the greatest living dead motivational speakers on the planet. You know, winner of the Golden Gavel Award. Amazing guy and a hero of mine. Oh, oh. But he was just so warm and, and, and just absolutely nailed it that I felt so comfortable with him that I verbally diarrheaed my story of transformation onto him. Oh. And he just listened intently. And he, and when he let me, when it, when he, when it, when I finished talking, he said, "Congratulations, Laban." I said, "Thanks, Liz." He said, "Do you have a book?" And I said, "No, I don't." And he said, "If you're going to be a speaker, you need a book for for to help with your credibility." And he said, "Who was the most influential person in your life when you were five years of age?" And I thought about it for a minute. I was like, "Man, despite her many flaws, would be my darling mother." And he said, what attributes did you get from her? And I was like, oh man, she was like spiritual and tenacious and unconditionally loving. And you know, and he's writing all this stuff down and he looks up at me and he says, Laban, this is a God moment. And for the next five minutes, he reads back to me a blueprint for this book that he wants me to write called Bet On You. And he even came up with the title right there. Came up with the title. He said, Laban, you're going to write the book. You're going to turn the book into a keynote. You're going to turn the keynote to a three-day ret um, retreat and he said you know even if you muck this up you're going to make two hundred thousand in the next 12 months and then he said and i'm going to write the forward for your book and this was mid-may 2020 now i didn't finish high school chris i never went to university i never did creative writing i've written two five-minute bits for some amateur comedy that i did but apart from that and i said les Thank you. I said, if you're going to do that, I'll have it to you by June 30 last year. So in six weeks during the most brutal lockdowns over here in Australia, I punched out 30,000 words of bet on you and changed my life in the process. And the rest, they say, is history. Wow. <clears throat> well, congratulations on that and all of that. And I want to back it up another step to explore another observation that I have of you that I already mentioned, which is courage. So how did you get Les Brown to guest to agree to do that, which led to this conversation, which led to him caring so deeply about this human that he's with that he didn't know, right? You guys didn't know each other, right? No, no, not at all. He's just listening to you. you. You verbally diary your story. He listens intently. He's taking notes. And he's thinking for you, right? And he doesn't even know. You. And he's telling you, all right, you're going to write a book. It's going to turn into a, a workshop. <laughs> okay. So how did, but how did you create that? Cause you created that. He then created for you by listening to you, which is an amazing testimonial to what a, an angel of a human being he is, but you were the creator of that conversation. How did that go down? So this is a great story, okay. in my own mind, at least. And I haven't had an opportunity to share it much because no one's really asked me this before. But in the lead up to me figuring out my reason for being on the planet, which for me is to be known as the most positively influential speaker on the goddamn planet, I worked in recruitment for a long time. And I, I worked in it for 13 years and I did okay at it considering I wasn't passionate about it. And then for the 14th year, I had a crack at running my own business which was a total unmitigated disaster. And I use that word only for effect because it ended up being the greatest thing in the world for me. But out of desperation, I started to have to learn to reach out to C-suite uh, people, uh, in particular CEOs uh, from that recruitment business. And what that did, mm. I was able to have some really great conversations with these people who were CEOs of fairly large organizations. Now, I still never made a placement in the recruitment business, but, there was a moment on January 2nd, 2020, where I got access to Brene Brown's phone number. Now, this is before the podcast, before the book, before I even had any kind of platform. I had nothing. I was basically a nobody in terms of the speaking business, right? And I got her phone number and I rang Brene Brown and she picked up the phone. 
And I knew that with my experience calling the C-suite that I needed to project confidence. And so she picked up the phone. She says, hi, Brene speaking. And I said, Brene Brown? She said, yes. I said, it's Laban Ditchburn from Melbourne, Australia. I said, I've been instructed by all of my mentors that I should surround myself with people that are much further along the, the line than I. And I wanted to um, reach out to see if you're interested in sharing some ideas. That's what I said to her. And this is, so we're, we're, we're ahead over here. So it was New Year's Day evening back in Texas, right? Oh. She said, well, Layman, thank you so much for your call. She said, I'm about to sit down and have New Year's Day dinner with my family. But if you'd be so kind to send me an email with what you had in mind. And I sent Brene Brown a follow-up email the next day with a little wee one-minute video introduction of who I was, which if I look back now is <laughs> just diabolically bad, right? Uh, and she responded mm. to me. She fucking responded to me. She said, Laban, thank you for getting in contact. She said, with what I have going on with family and university at the moment, I can't give this the attention that it deserves. You will do fantastically. And I, it's, wow, I'm getting a little bit emotional just thinking about that. And what she did in that process was that she gave me the belief to know that I could talk to anyone. So when I called Les Brown, and I'll give a tip for people out there that want to connect with amazing people, there's a plugin for Google Chrome called Lucia, L U S H A dot C O. And it scrapes the back end. It's not. It's a non-approved LinkedIn thing, but it's it's a legal product. And Les Les Brown's mobile phone number was on there. And so on a Saturday morning over here in Melbourne, Australia. Do you Australia, know about this? Did, sorry. Does he know about this part? Uh, he. If anyone ever asks me how I got their phone number, I'm always truthful. Mm. But I, I don't go out of my way to tell people. <laughs> Um, but I, when I rung him, he said, uh, and I tried to call him three months earlier, four months earlier and never got, never got through, but he picked up and he's like, uh, this is Les speaking. And I said, Les Brown. And I stood up and I was in bed and I was naked. I stood up next to my window. <laughs> Sorry, neighbors. And I said, Les Brown, it's Laban Ditchburn from Melbourne, Australia here. He said, how can I help you, my boy? And I said, Les Brown. I said, I'm the host of an amazing podcast series called Become Your Own Superhero. I'm a huge fan of your work and what you do. And I'd be honored if you came on to the show and shared your story with the world. When are you available? And he said, what are you thinking, boy? And I said, Les, to be honest, whenever you're available probably works with me. And we booked it in for the, it was like midnight on Monday in my time, about three days later. Oh. And I hung up <laughs> the phone and my fiance is in the bed standing, sitting, lying next to me. And she just, with this bewilderment. And I was like, I just got Les Brown on the podcast. And uh, the rest, as they say, is, is history. But I, I want to unpack that a little bit more, okay? Because it's there's something really profound for me. You're not lucky. <clears throat> well, you know, look, it's, are you familiar with Byron Katie? I don't know. I don't know that I am. Well, I'll show you what she looks like. This is one of her most, this is probably easily her most famous book. Oh, her name's very familiar. Loving what is. Yeah, that's it. Her actual first name is Byron. Her last name is Katie. Yeah, right. Yeah, she's got a million amazing quotes. Uh, my favorite of her quotes is, uh, until you are able to respond to all of life with enthusiasm, your work is not done. But that's not the quote that had me think of her just now. It's another one which of hers, which is, uh, which reminds me of you, which is everyone would have everything that they wanted if they were only willing to ask a thousand people for it. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And you, so what is it about you that, and I, I guess the answer is going to be dino balls, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that has you be willing to call up a Brene Brown or do whatever you need to do to get the phone number for Les Brown and just, and just go, all right, this is who I am. And this is what I, it's up. Cause I, you know, I'm pretty clear. Most people wouldn't do that. Most people would come up with a million different instantly have a million different reasons why. Yeah, I can't, I'm not going to do that. I'm a nobody. What the hell is he going to want to do with me? You know, uh, what if he asks how you guys are? all these 
you know, obstacles, all these perceived reasons why not to do that. What's your deal? Are you like, what are you, an anomaly over there? I, I have a funny feel. I, I don't know exactly what it is, Chris, but I've got a funny feeling it relates to this. Before I met my darling fiance, we've been together for, for nearly three years. Uh, three years this month we met, actually. Anna. Anna, Anna the beautiful three-quarter Russian, one-quarter Japanese Dana, right? She's a 10, <laughs> 10 inside and out. And and I met her in the streets of Melbourne and, and cold approached, which is going up without having any knowledge, any introduction, stone cold sober. I'm a full straight edge teetotaler anyway, in the middle of the day and asked her out. And what led up to that was for a period of uh, two years in between two one year relationships before her, I went on 151st dates through Bumble and Tinder through dating apps. Oh my and and 75% of them would have been stone cold sober as well. And because of my recruitment background, most of them were really fun dates. I, it was very rare that we, we went on a date where it just fizzled out straight away. There was plenty of times where there wasn't lots of chemistry, but there was fundamentally good experiences. Now, I don't know if for anyone else that's been on that many first dates and because there was follow up dates and other women oh, that I would that's see. A lot for of a dates, man. That's a lot of dates. It's, it was, it works out to be two and a half a week in that, in that time zone. I was a machine, right? But I dedicated, I wanted to meet the person in my dreams. And, and that was the part of my process at that time it was part of my change, my transformation. Mm -hmm. I'd been losing weight and getting in shape and attracting higher and higher quality uh, human beings, you know? Yeah. You lost a lot of weight. Dropped 60 pounds of body fat and put on 30 pound of muscle um, over the course of the whole thing. So my whole physique is transformed. And I mean, that certainly helps. But that whole experience with uh, going on all those dates, I think, I don't know, there's something about it that it, it gave me a, a confidence, a, a self-belief in myself that I never had. And then the combination of speaking to CEOs and realizing that I could add a lot of value into these people's lives. And and the, the point of all of this now is that I don't see I don't look up to these people like they're unattainable now wow. because what I didn't tell you about the Les Brown thing was at the end of that podcast, when we finished recording, Les Brown, for those who've read his books, have heard him speak recently, has gone through prostate cancer twice. Yeah. And the second round metastasized in his lower back. He developed, he's put on 100 pounds of body weight. He's, he developed some metabolic health, some type 2 diabetes as a result. And I said to him, Les, what can I help you with at the end? He said, well, what did you have in mind? And I said, Les, I've heard that you stacked on a bunch of weight. You know, it was public domain. Um, a number of people that I've interviewed are experts in reversing type two diabetes just through dietary intervention. And I said, I, you know, I know, I've done it myself as well. I can introduce you to some of these people. Oh. And he said, send it, send me everything. And what transpired was in December last year, there was a three-way Zoom conference call with me, Dr. Chris Kenobi, who's become a really good friend of mine, and Les Brown. And Chris Kenobi, who heard about this incident, saw the footage of Les, you know, proclaiming, proclaiming this book onto me and was so touched by it that he wanted to help Les for free and shared all this amazing information. Oh. There's this really amazing moment in my life where Les Brown asks, who's a deeply Christian man asks Chris Kenobi, who's also a deeply Christian man, and and to pray for Les, his family, and me. Now, I'm not a Christian guy, but I'm very spiritual. And I'll tell you right now, I happily bowed my head to receive those prayers. Mm -hmm. And I got Chris Kenobi praying for Les Brown and, and me. And it was one of the most, like, just ridiculous moments in my life. I was like, mm -hmm. is this actually happening? So I'm not sure whether that answers your question. <laughs> well, uh, well, it, well, it does, because what you're saying is that you're not just trying to get, right? We've talked about Bob Berg and the, the one of the uh, two authors of the book, The Go-Giver. And, <clears throat> you know, you, you get that whole mentality, which is prioritizing, bringing value over your own benefit and trusting that, that your profit and benefit will occur spontaneously as a result. And you get that. And so that's, so there's a lot in there that you said, man, it's like, you're not putting people on pedestals and you're also being a servant to them. 
So you don't have, you know, and you use these dates, you know, you say like that was training for you to have the courage to simply ask for things, right? Um, but even that still required courage. To, I get, I'm assuming like to go on a shitload of dates like that requires some courage. Yeah. Especially sober as well for someone who used alcohol for 20 years of his life, you know, right. like, 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 like high functioning alcoholic. Uh, yeah. Like really struggled with it. And yeah. I'm just celebrated my sixth year, a fifth year of sobriety uh, baby. Uh, without, and it's not diminishing anyone who's had, you had to use a program AA or NA or whatever. Uh, I got to the root cause of why I was escaping. And I think, as part of some of the stuff I talk about in the book, I believe that I figured out a system for me, at least that I can share of removing any desire to want to escape. So for me, giving up all of those things has been really fucking simple. And I don't want to take it. I wasn't say it's easy, but it's been simple because I don't crave. I don't want any of those things. I'm, I've had some um, challenges in my life, you know, when I ran that recruitment business, I nearly went bankrupt three times that year. Uh, my fiance and I have experienced 13 miscarriages. She set a record at the Royal Women's Hospital here. And like, and, I, and I'm not saying that for sympathy for anyone. Like, I would hope that I don't look like someone who's carrying the weight of that kind of, you know, pressure on their shoulders. It's because I'm not. And I look at everything like that as a lesson, as an opportunity to grow. And, and, and it sort of ties in with this fearlessness, like what's the worst they're going to say? No. And sometimes they do say no. Mm -hmm. And sometimes yeah, like, they say, like Brene Brown, she said, no, but she said no in a quite beautiful way too. Best way ever. She, right. and she, what the fuck was I going to talk to Brene, Brene Brown about? <laughs> I had nothing. <laughs> well, wait, 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 wait. Why were you calling her in the first place? Um, Did you want to have her on a, as a guest? I, I was, I know there was no podcast at that point. There was no, I had no platform. I had nothing. Who are you calling? I just for? wanted to share, share some ideas. I just, just developing my own dino balls. Like I, I knew that I needed to, to speak oh, you, to these people. You said to her in the beginning is I just want to surround myself with amazing people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my other, I had another See, that? See that's so good. Okay. So even my question is jacked. I'll tell you a question. What I'm going to own you? this. I'm owning it. It's like as if you need to have a damn reason. Like you have to, what was your legitimate excuse for giving her a call? Right, right. The question, I didn't ask it that way, but that's basically what it's saying is like, well, why were you calling in the first place? And, and <clears throat> what I'm hearing you guys, I felt like it, like I was compelled to. I, I've got to attribute Steve Seabold to who's a speaker in the US. I'm not sure whether you heard of him. Well, I've been very familiar with Steve Siebel. So the, he, he wrote a book called 177 Mental Toughness Secrets of the World Class. Former tennis pro, played in the Agassi era, wrote this amazing book after interviewing hundreds of successful people about why they were successful. And a lot of that, like a lot of his points, as you would know, reference to the importance of surrounding yourself with people that you want to be like. And, um, and being like being developing fearless. I mean, I talking about developing courage. I honestly, Chris, I believe that my, the fundamental changes I've made in my diet have made a massive difference to my levels of courage and confidence. So you're, a, you're a vegan. I eat vegans. <laughs> <laughs> That chewy. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> oh good lord. <laughs> yeah, you like meat much? I'm a big fan. You I'm... have. I mean, in your in your LinkedIn, I was laughing so hard today. I don't know if that's new because I didn't notice it before. <laughs> you actually put that in your LinkedIn profile. You can identify as steak and steaks. That my pronouns, yeah. I just uh <laughs> pronouns to me are so ridiculous that I thought I'd I'd have a bit of fun with them, but yeah. um, no, for, well, for health reasons, as part of my sort of journey, I was able to put an autoimmune disease that I had for 17 years into full remission. And, and I had, what I suffered from was a condition called GERD, which is the capital G E R D gastrointestinal reflux disorder, which is, if anyone hasn't heard of it, some of the worst indigestion or heartburn you can possibly get. 
Mm. And, it, and it turns out it's a result of low stomach acid, not excessive stomach acid, as some people believe. Mm. And, and it was all diet related. And as part of my journey, I, I came to understand that I could sort that out by removing refined carbohydrate out of my diet. So I was very heavily gluten intolerant, so any bread or pastas, that kind of thing as well, but also any refined carbohydrates. Uh, and when I eliminated those, I started getting better. And I was told by 20 different medical professionals that what I had was an incurable disease and that I must stick on this medication that I've been on for 17 years, right? Mm. So turns out that's the biggest load of bullshit that ever existed. And mm. so my faith in the medical industry, uh, I was like, well, if they're lying to me about this, whether intentionally or unintentionally, what else are they wrong about? And so I went down the rabbit hole of trying to work out the best ways to optimize my body, repair a lot of the damage that I thought I might've done from my years of alcohol abuse and doing pounds of cocaine and like just smashing my body with stress and just abuse, right? Mm. And as I started to remove more and more plants out of my diet, I started to feel better and better and better. And the reason from a mechanistic point of view why plants can cause a lot of problems if you've had any gut health issues, plants in their organic state, before they've even been sprayed with pesticides and stuff, contain lots of their own natural protection mechanisms because they don't have four legs and they can't run away. Things like lectins, phytates, salicylates, oxalates, that kind of thing as well. Now, I don't wanna to get too technical, but the fundamental thing is that if you've got an aggravated gut, which most humans in the Western world have, oh you need to give that time away to repair itself. And so by removing things like fiber and, and you know, nightshades and these things that can aggravate the gut, you allow the gut to heal. It's very commonly known that like 90% of all the dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin is generated in our gut. I was burning a lot of my own body fat as fuel. You know, with when you lose 60 pounds of body fat and you put on all this muscle, you know, your composition changes so you start feeling sexy and you're confident. Women start paying attention to the street and plenty of dudes as well. Bit of a gay magnet there. And a uh, bit of an, I think, probably an otter in the uh, gay community as opposed to the bear that I used to be, right? Oh, my God. And, uh, and then all this magical, you know, feelings would sort of be coursing through my veins. I started ultra distance running inexplicably out of the blue. You know, I went from running five kilometers which is three miles to a full marathon in 14 days and i ran it in three hours 56 my very first marathon and oh, then i was like me. and then i ran a 50k five weeks later which is 30 miles and then ran a 100 kilometer which is a 60 mile in uh, september of that year in 2018 i've done completed three of them since wow um plus a number of other ultras so um wow. i fundamentally believe that the fact that I got my body working the way it has evolved to work, that it gave me all of the, the, the chemicals and the hormones and stuff for me to take on whatever the world can throw at me. So ringing up fucking Brene Brown was a piece of piss. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I'm going to share an observation that I'm having of you, which is I don't, I don't suspect you give too much of a crap of what people think about you. What people think of me is none of my damn business. Right. You know, who's, I, you know, whose quote I think that is. Les Browns. Oh, well, he might've, he might've, might be firing Oh, really? Could Maybe be. he got it from her. Yeah. yeah they're probably Quotes are so hard to pin. I bet those two are buds. Really? I bet they are. Yeah. I bet they're comrades. I know, I know he references it in conversation we've had and in his book and stuff. So what, wherever it came from, I'm grateful that they can't because it's been really helpful because when you go and, you know, exist on an all meat diet, now full disclosure, I've started to be able to reintroduce some um, plant foods and stuff, right? But it's a really, really effective way for people to fix particularly autoimmune disease, right? Mm. Really effective way. And it's nothing that the medical profession will go near because they're idiots. And uh, <laughs> and uh, and when you're like in Melbourne here, which is like the vegan capital of Australia, people don't like it. When oh, really? 
when you talk about it. Yeah, it's like, the, like the San Francisco or, uh, of the US maybe, but um, which is why I'm leaving. <laughs> Going into state. And um, uh, people don't like it, you know. And and so I've been burying my head in the facts. Uh, you know, I just, I want the truth, Chris, so I can make an informed decision. And then I will pivot if I, you know, I'm, I'm self-aware enough to know that I don't know anything uh, and that I'll, that I can keep learning and pivot and adjust. I'm not dogmatic. I don't hold on to these beliefs. If I find out what I'm doing is actually bad for me, I'll change it. But uh, proof's in the pudding so far, you know. Hell yeah, man. Well, <clears throat> your book's on Amazon. Uh, bet on you, Laban Ditchburn. And um, we're going to put links, of course, into our show notes. But for those of us or those of the uh, Tough Talks tribe who won't be reading the show notes because they're listening or when they're out in their car or on a runner or something, can you give them some places to go to learn more about you, to follow you, connect with you? Yeah, and I, just before I do, I just got to say thank you from the bottom of my heart, Chris, for this opportunity. I, I'm a huge fan of you and what you do, what you do and uh and uh, if you haven't you need to subscribe to this show because it's fucking elite and uh you you'll become a better human being but everything's all centralized thank you buddy no my absolute pleasure and and i mean it i mean it sincerely uh laban ditchburn.com and laban which is a really unusual name means yogurt in arabic (laughs) of course it does why wouldn't it explains explains why i'm so cultured (laughs) Um, but it also means fight in Filipino, like to show fight. Oh, really? So Laban is L-A-B-A-N, and then ditch burn is like dig a ditch and burn, labanditchburn.com. And uh, we'd love to connect with you in whichever way you deem uh, most enjoyable for you. Right on, man. Well, thanks for being so damn fun, funny, transparent, and committed to service. I think, you know, I'll tell you what, I, I'm not, I can't speak for any of the tribe, Tough Talks tribe, but I can definitely speak for myself, which means I'm probably speaking for at least some of them, <laughs> which is that when I, you know, I feel like liberated by your uh, courageous transparency. Like just don't, you do not care uh, if anyone takes offense. You're not trying to offend anyone. You just don't give a shit if they take offense to your uh, authentic expression and, I, and i'll tell you what bro that's liberating so thank you for that in addition to the way that you choose to show up live powerfully heal yourself and serve others man i really appreciate that and i just say in closing the reason why i do that is because when i own all of my foibles i take back ownership and no one can now hold anything against me and that is the most empowering thing that I've found. That's freedom, baby. You rock, brother. Appreciate you, man. Thanks. So uh, we stayed on, Laban and I stayed on for a little bit after we stopped recording because he's become a friend of mine and I really enjoy him. And, and, you know, we got to talking and one of the things I shared with him, which I don't think I said out loud i know i thought it but i don't think i uh, created the opportunity to articulate it aloud during the interview which is i really uh, find it refreshing that he doesn't give a damn about people taking offense to him now you know that i don't believe it's possible for any one human being to offend another that we take offense based on our interpretations and he's not concerned about that I think that became, I mean, if you watch the whole thing, I think that was abundantly clear. Uh, He really, Laban, what I love about him, one of the things is that he's driven, he's really driven by service. He didn't, he didn't articulate uh, the magnitude of his commitment to serving humanity. I think he was a little bit humble today, quite honestly. And um, the guy is really wizardly smart. And, uh, and I really appreciate his story. Uh, I appreciate I don't, One other thing I told him afterwards is that his impersonations are pretty good. You know, he did the Sean Connery one really quick, but then he did Dr. Was it Dr. He did one million? I forget who that is. That, that movie, that funny slapstick movie. But anyway, um, yeah, Laban's a special cat. Check out his book. 
bet on you and we'll put that's on amazon we'll put the link in here in the show notes and check out his podcast become your own superhero all right folks thanks as always for tuning in and until next time great miracles <laughs>